Are tablets just toys? How to get work done and be green with mobile devices. Thanks so much for joining us today everyone. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Program Manager here of our webinar program at TechSoup Global. I've been with the organization for about 7 years, and prior to that spent a decade working at small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Oakland, California. Also joining us is TechSoup's own Jim Lynch, who has had a long career at TechSoup and has been involved in creating all of our environmental programs. He has written extensively about mobile technologies, tablets, apps, and telework, and how they are revolutionizing the workplace, decreasing operations costs for organizations. I like to refer to him as the godfather of our refurbished computer program because he really is the person who established it and helped refurbishment take off worldwide. So I'm proud to call him my colleague and friend. Mr. Jim Lynch will be joining us and sharing a little bit about the green benefits of tablets because we are in Earth Month after all. Also joining us today is Glenn Collins who has been with CDI for more than 7 years and heads the development and delivery of the company's mobile technology offerings. Working with Microsoft, Intel, and other leading technology companies, Glenn's goal is to lend a hand to our customers in the education and nonprofit sectors by improving learning outcomes through the deployment of cost-effective mobile solutions. His extensive experience with technology and customer relations helps him generate solutions that bring exceptional value to CDI customers. So he'll be talking to us about tablets overall, and later on in the program we will also have time to talk a little bit about some of the discounted hardware that they make available to nonprofits and public libraries in the United States. You will also see assisting with chat my coworker Ali Bezdikian who is the interactive video and events producer here at TechSoup. And she will be on hand to help flag your questions and help you with any technical issues throughout the webinar. Now TechSoup, we are here in San Francisco's office. And Jim actually is traveling today in the great state of Texas. And Glenn is joining us from I believe a suburb outside of Toronto in Canada. But I believe CDI's headquarters is in Ch Chicago area. So go ahead and chat in to let us know from where you are joining today. And I know everyone can't see what is being chatted in, so I will share a few of the places. I have folks saying they are from Minnesota, Illinois, Colorado, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New York. Arizona, New York, California, North Carolina, Alabama, Vancouver, all over the world and all over the country. So we are glad to have you all joining us. Thanks so much for chiming in in the chat. If there are things that you ch chat into us that we think would be useful for other participants to, to know or hear, we will be sure to try and share those back out with you. We have around 160 people on the line with us right now, so I am really glad to have you all joining. A look at our agenda. We will do a quick introduction to TechSoup. We'll have a poll to get you to weigh in on how you're currently using tablets. We'll talk a little bit about how these are greener tech, and then we'll talk about the big question of the day, are tablets tools or toys for your workplace? We'll spend a little bit of time talking about laptops versus tablets, and what to look for in office-grade tablets if you decide you want to go down that road. We'll have a couple of minutes toward the end to discuss new and refurbished hardware through TechSoup and time for Q&A. So TechSoup Global is a nonprofit network of 63 partner NGOs worldwide operating in 121 countries working to provide technology knowledge and resources around the globe to social sector and civil organizations. You can learn more about our work in our 2014 Year in Review which is linked on this slide. You can't click it today, but you'll have the slide deck and you can look at it later. We have done this all over the world, delivering services to more than 615,000 NGOs to the tune of nearly $5 billion in technology products and grants for the greater good. So I'm proud to have been not only a TechSoup user before I started at TechSoup, but also a TechSoup staff person. You can learn more about our programs at TechSoup.org. Now we are at the time where it is up to you, our users, our participants in today's webinar. Feel free to click any of these that make sense to you. Are you currently using tablets at your workplace? Yes for staff, maybe yes for patrons or constituents. Uh, maybe you are not and you don't know if you will bother going with tablets at any point soon. Maybe you aren't yet but you plan to sometime in the near future. And if you have something else to tell us, go ahead and chat in the comments. I think it's interesting to note that around half of our registrants for today's webinar came to us from public libraries. So we're glad to have you on 
the line with us. We often we, we serve public libraries and nonprofits with our programs, but on our general webinars that are not specifically library focused, we tend to only have 15 or 20 percent participants from or participation from libraries. So we're glad that this is a topic that's of interest to both our audiences that we like to serve. So I'm going to give just another couple of minutes for people to respond. I have a few folks saying that many volunteers are bringing tablets in. Um, somebody else is saying, I'm in between no, not sure, and not yet, and plan to soon. So maybe this webinar will help you make up your mind on that. Uh, some people will say, I use my personal tablet at work, but internal staff use desktops. Client-facing staff use laptops. So a whole variety. Uh, people are saying they use it for workshop sign-ins or student college visits, bus trip sign-ins. Lots of great uh, responses coming into the chat. So I'm going to show the full results so everybody can see how our audience stacks up. And it looks like half of you, or I'm sorry, not half of you, around 40% of you are using them for staff in some capacity or another. And around almost 30% are not and are not sure that you will. So that's a pretty good spread between our audience uh, on the line with us right now. And around 20% are saying not yet, but we plan to soon. And another 21% yes for patrons or constituents. So this is really helpful for us so that as we get into this topic more, we can uh, use the experiences that you've shared with us in this poll to educate uh, a little bit about what we um, how you're using them and how we can serve you in using them. All right, I'd like to have Glenn Collins from CDI join us on the line to talk about that bigger question of how we frame today's event. Are tablets just toys? Glenn, what is your take? What do you think about that question? I think it's a, it's a great question, and I think it's, uh, the, the right answer is it depends. Um, so I'm going to jump in and take over, and we'll come back to Jim, I assume, uh, shortly. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me today. I'm, I'm uh, very happy to be a participant, and uh, certainly we enjoy our partnership with um, TechSoup. And uh, when Becky asked me to do this, uh, originally it was a bit of a challenge because uh, of the diversity of the audience. So I tried to say, what, if, if it was me, what would the questions, and if I was in the audience, what questions would I want to know, and, and I'm assuming that everybody that's joined is looking at, and at least 40% of you are using some type of mobile device. And the question really starts to be, should I look, be looking at a laptop, a tablet? Um, what, what can I actually do with the tablet if that's what I choose? And then maybe that will help me make my decision. And then I guess the, the last question is, if that was the route I was going down, what should I look for in a tablet? So hopefully I will uh, give you some answers and, or at least invoke some questions you need to think about as you're making these choices. Um, so laptop versus, uh, versus uh, tablets, really I guess the, the line of all of these devices is beginning to blur substantially. So I just really want to start out by talking about the dominance that mobile computing is, is starting to take, take over the, uh, the world. And that's really because people want the ability to do computing anywhere, anytime and the convenience of having something that comes on, turns on in a hurry, um, as opposed to you know, what we're used to in a desktop environment. And in, in many cases, the tablet's adequate. You may need a, a laptop, et cetera. And we'll touch on all of those things in the next little while. But the move, the real move to mobility for the convenience of being able to do uh, stuff anywhere, anytime, has is, is been made available to us because of the powerful systems available that are, that are affordable and available today are so different than they were just a few years ago. Uh, the, the Internet world, if you will, where all of the applications and content, and in the case of libraries, often e-books are available electronically. So we consume information substantially different than we used to. And that really lends itself towards that mobility and to be able to do that anywhere and anytime. So we're starting to see the mobile devices take over the market, but we're also starting to see the delineation between form factors to, to begin to blur. So you've got you know, form factors like a phone, and you've got what they consider a tablet, which is halfway between a tablet and a phone. You've got a tablet, which is a pure, uh, maybe an iPad would be a pure tablet. And then you've got two-in-one devices that are uh, very much 
kind of have a crossbreed between a tablet and a laptop. And then, of course, you're all very familiar with the laptop. The reality is that all of those devices are, have a, a use and a function, and many of us, including myself, carry, I carry a 6-inch phone, I carry a 10-inch tablet, I carry a, and a laptop that has touch on it as well, so, and a desktop. So I have four devices that I use every day, depending on what functionality I'm trying to do. And I don't think that's going to be abnormal going forward. But let's talk a little bit about when is the choice right uh, for a laptop versus a tablet. And, you know, laptops obviously have been around for a long time and they're very popular with uh, a lot of uh, groups and, and uh, for specific users. And likewise, tablets are the same way. So let's take a quick look as to the strengths in each of those. So basically the laptop has morphed into a device that is now almost as powerful as any desktop out there with the convenience of being somewhat mobile, somewhat light, and um, you know, somewhat fashionable, I guess, to some degree. Um, so and as time goes on, they're becoming more functional, more powerful, more lighter, and more you know, slim. Uh, the mobile computer started out many years ago as a, what looked like a sewing machine they used to carry around, and they've come a long way since then in terms of functionality, uh, the quality of the screens, et cetera. So these actually have taken over and, and will outsell desktop computers substantially. All the mobile categories will over the next little while. And so you're all very familiar with them. I think there is a move to kind of move laptops to be more tablet-like. So, so the size uh, from the 17-inch devices that we used to see are now morphing down to 11.6 inches. They're becoming convertible so that I can actually flip the lid over and do touch the screen over, I'm sorry, lie it flat and touch uh, technology just like a tablet. So I think, again, the, the laptops, well, the strength of the laptops uh, is for creation. So if, you, uh, if your functions that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis are more from a creation standpoint than a consumption standpoint, then there's a lot of benefits to using uh, a laptop. And then we look at tablets, and tablets are lighter. Um, they are the most current of all the technologies at the moment. All of the manufacturers are racing toward coming up with the ultimate solution for everyone. Um, you know, thank, thank you, Steve Jobs, for creating this category that didn't exist, that was ignored by Microsoft and Intel, was ignored by a lot of people, but Steve Jobs had a vision that it was going to be a category, and he basically created a category uh, that is, is new you know, within the last four or five years, and uh, is now, uh, they predict by 2016, there'll be more tablets sold than all of the other form factors combined, laptops, uh, notebooks, desktops, all combined, there'll be more tablets sold. But again, as I said, that's a tough measurement because the form factor, the tablet is becoming it is getting closer to the notebook and the notebook closer to the tablet. So the line between them is starting to blur. So the strengths of, of the, uh, the tablet devices are actually, you know, some of them are very obvious. They're light. They're really easy to move around. They turn on in, in a second. They, they're basically instant on machines, which if you are, want to do some quick surfing at a restaurant or you're, you know, mobile somewhere is a very convenient uh, feature to have. The, it, the design of the devices is, is actually um, the chipset, everything else. They, they design them so that they would, uh, they're fanless devices, so that they can make them a lot smaller. Uh, they created a chipset that allows them to be almost uh, without causing heat. So the challenge for years in portable technology has been the, the heat that the chipset gave off. Well, uh, that wasn't that long ago that Intel came up with a chipset that they use in these devices that allows them to be fanless and allows them to remain cool. So uh, those, that chipset is also um, uh, one that allows for a long life battery. So it has some limited functionality because they gave it the things they thought people with mobile devices would want. So some of these devices, because of that chipset, will get 10, 12 hours of battery, some of them as many as 14 hours. And they're also designed from a graphic standpoint, so they will produce higher resolution graphics quicker than most of the other devices. So you've got, 
you've got these, de these devices that are designed you know, for consuming information, consuming media-rich information at a very high speed and in a very expensive way. So again, in a very general terms, if you are uh, a consumer, more consumer than a creator of content, then this is a great device to have. So, uh, and, I mean, and the younger generation in particular loves the touch. They love the ability to use this anywhere. So some of us older people <laughs> are looking for keyboards and we want to engage in, a, in with the device differently, but the newer generations uh, are very much used to this form factor and have picked it up and learned it almost instantly. Um, so, um, you know, I, I just tried to put in a little comparison, and again, understanding, I even stuck in a picture of a two-in-one, which kind of sits between a tablet and a laptop. But if I just do a quick checklist, the, the laptops tend to be more powerful. They are, you know, much um, more powerful chipset. The chips, uh, of course, create heat, so most of the laptops require fans, um, and it causes all kinds of other technology issues where the where, but it also drains the battery, so you don't have long life batteries in the laptops. Typically, you've got two, three hours. Uh, again, I talked about the creation versus consumption. So if you are doing a lot of work, if I have to type a long paper, I'm much more likely to do it on my laptop than I am on my tablet. Uh, many of the devices out there aren't touch, so if you get used to touch, um, you have to spend a little more money on a laptop to get touch in it, but most of the most of the experience we have are not touch devices. And relative to tablets, they tend to be more money, although there are some introduction of some devices that actually use the tablet chipset in them that are now, they look just like a notebook, but they have the insides, if you will, of a tablet, and the price point on those is in the $250 range. So the, the, the industry is changing depending on the customer's needs. Um, and if I look at tablets, I talked about the strengths being the battery life, uh, the graphics ability to present rich media in a better way. Uh, they're, they're typically uh, better priced than a equivalent laptop or notebook. They're smaller, they're lighter, they're more portable. And again, the device is really designed um, for consumption. And, and if you're trying to make a decision between the two of them, there's uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things, and we'll go through that shortly, but there really isn't a clear choice because it depends so much on what you're going to do with it or what your employees or staff or um, customers are going to do with the device as to which one makes the better choice. So what I tried to do is just put together um, some, so these are some statistics and some information on tablets. I apologize for breaking the rule on PowerPoint and putting too much text here, but um, basically, I thought there was some, some information that was uh, relevant, and that is really, as I said earlier, the, the concept of uh, tablet, the growth in the tablet industry is, is beyond anybody's imagination. There was two point, or 235 million sold in, in uh, 2014, and 2016 they assumed that 30% of all uh, small business, medium business, large business, enterprise, education will all carry a mobile device of some kind. And, and t further to that point, as I mentioned earlier, it's expected that either this year or next year, the sale of tablets will uh, eclipse the sale of all other form factors combined. Um, so there are many ways that you can boost productivity. People tend to use the devices uh, quicker, more often, they're more responsive when the device is with them and they can use it anywhere, anytime. So from an employee standpoint, there are studies that show that you actually, if the application is correct, the productivity of that staff goes up by having the devices in their hands. Um, you can utilize it you know, anywhere, anytime, which I think is important. So you think uh, the, the applications that are available, uh, you're not tied to a desktop, you're not even tied to where you have to find a place you can sit your laptop down, open it up, wait for it to boot. You can basically turn these on, they're instant on, and off you go in terms of utilizing the, the device. And often now, uh, particularly in North America, Wi-Fi is so readily available that the device is not only up and running, and on all of these devices you can actually do work on them without connecting, but most of them have, um, you know, you have access to Wi-Fi just about everywhere. So that makes it a big difference in terms of the usability of these devices. 
So tablets for business, and I, I looked at this and knowing, and I say business, which with, uh, it, with my real uh, meant was for organizations and nonprofit organizations that are on, on the call today, really, because a lot of the functionality that a business does, the nonprofit organizations have to do as well. So things like um, the cloud or the Internet or whatever we want to call it this week, are really allowing the world of business or the or nonprofit organizations to utilize these devices in, in way better than ever before. You know, the access to having all of your documents in one place that are accessible from the web, the concepts of having online applications available to you, they all make these devices almost interchangeable. So you might want to, you may have a desktop at your desk and a, and an app, or a tablet elsewhere when you're mobile, and yet you can do pretty much the same function, um, maybe not as easily on the tablet as a desktop, but you can actually do those things. So myself, as I said earlier, I have, and, and I happen to have everything in a Windows environment, but you could do the same thing with Apple, and you could do the same thing with Android. I have a Windows phone, I have a tablet, I have a desktop in my office, and I have a notebook. And all of them are synced. All of my documents are online, no matter where I am, what device I have in my hand. I can actually utilize um, those devices. And, and you know, I, I use Windows just because I'm 100 years old and I've used it forever. But the same holds true if you're using Google Docs. The same holds true if you're in the, using iCloud or uh, iPad applications. All of those things are um, available to you. So the concept is really the device is important and it's what you're used to. And, and you use the right device for the right activity. But truly, it, it, today's world, almost everybody has uh, the ability to utilize multiple devices to create and, and get access to their own uh, information. I saw somebody talk about Office 365 in the chat room. There are, I mean, Microsoft, Google, uh, Apple, they've all done a really good job of moving productivity tools to the, uh, to the cloud and that allow you to, to do all kinds of things on all kinds of devices. And, and, and Microsoft's environment with Windows 10, that the actual uh, uh, operating system will recognize what it's running on, and it will provide you it will f it will provide you an interface that's appropriate for that uh, software for that device. So you could use PowerPoint on any device, and if it's on a phone, I'm going to have a slightly different interface than I am on my desktop because it will be it will automatically figure it out and design it for the phone. That's where all of these things are going. And I know Google's doing the same thing. I work with Google all the time. I know where they're going in terms of Google Docs, et cetera. So the, uh, I guess the interactivity of all these devices certainly is something that you're going to have to provide if you want productivity out of your organization. So lots of new devices. Almost every new app is being designed not only as the application, but to have the ability to present itself depending on the device that you're utilizing. So most Anybody that's, you know, all websites now, when you produce a website, you're producing it so that it can be seen on a desktop or a notebook or on a mobile device, a phone, a tablet, a tablet. All of that is trending toward us being able to use the right device depending on what we're trying to accomplish and where we physically are. So, um, you know, tablets allow you to do all the web activity. All, you know, we talked about this. It's great for consumption of information. You can do basic emails on it all the time. You can actually, what, what I do with mine all the time is I talk to it. I, I don't have to type on it. I can just, uh, using the Windows environment, I can speak to it. It will do voice to text, and, and uh, that way I don't get caught texting while I'm driving. Um, so I can utilize that function on my tablet or my, my telephone. Uh, productivity tools, again, in, in Windows case, it would be uh, Office 365, Google Docs, you can use Microsoft Office on an iPad environment. All of those are available to you. Productivity tools, are, there's tons of them for the tablets. And in Android's world, there's lots of free ones. So they have Kingsoft software for Android, which is very much like Microsoft Office. It will actually allow you to edit Microsoft Office documents. Um, and then, of course, everybody who's producing applications now are trying to produce it so it's available in the cloud. Uh, so you don't, the, the move from owning and licensed software to renting um, time or renting, uh, you know, a subscription to a service that provides, you know, accounting information or all of these things, you can do all of that online today. So there are, um, you know, it really makes the devices much more. And of course, just like we're doing today, 
this meeting online. You could do it on a tablet. You could do it on a phone. All of the meeting tools are now allowing you to utilize mobile devices. So you can, you can sit in on this meeting while you're at a Starbucks having a coffee. And so I started then, given the audience today, I thought the other thing that was interesting is I, I spend a lot of time with educators talking about the utilization of tablets in transitioning the way we educate our students. And I, you know, so I went back and I started looking at, well, what do I know that I can help the library folks on this call with? And I, I, what, I started, what I started to find out was that many of the libraries, obviously that for a long time there was PCs available in libraries, desktop computers. Uh, that uh, they shared with their members. And uh, a lot of those are now being replaced with uh, mobile devices. And because they're cheaper, you can have more of them. Uh, they're also uh, uh, on loan now. So there are a lot of libraries that are attracting members by lending out these devices. Um, and obviously with the advent of e-books, um, the, the whole concept of the hard copy book is changing. Uh, some will argue for the worse. Some will argue for the better. I, have, I probably read a book every two weeks, and I haven't bought a hard copy book in four years, I don't think. So um, the convenience of being able to buy a book at 1 o'clock in the morning when I, I need to sleep and I, can't, I need something to read far outweighs the, the, uh, the hard copy uh, concept. Anyways, um, so I think uh, libraries can utilize these devices in a creative way that draws more customers and draws more members. There's a buzz about tablets. It is the, for lack of a better term, sexy device right now. If you are uh, able to provide the, the, your public with the access to these that they normally wouldn't have them in a way that's obviously meaningful to them to, to consume information, uh, it makes a great deal of sense. I also found some libraries that were providing training sessions for iPads. And, Windows devices, et cetera. So I thought that was a pretty good concept because, again, you know, I know libraries are constantly trying to figure out how to continue to drive people in and to build up your membership. So those are some of the things I, I was able to come across in doing a bit of research for today. Um, so if you are going to buy a tablet, if you are going to buy tablets for your utilization, then what are the things you need to look at? It Does it make the sense to you. And, I, and, they, and as I said earlier, it depends. You know, the first thing I ask everybody when we start with is, what are you going to do with it? What, what do you do most often? What functions do you do when you're use, utilizing technology? So is it the right fit? What environment are you working in? And when I say that, I'm talking about ecosystems. Are you in the Windows environment? Are you in a Apple environment, etc.? Um, how long do you expect it to last? Because most of the consumer devices are built with about a 24-month life cycle expectancy. And that isn't from necessarily just a manufacturer standpoint. It's from the, that's what they anticipate the consumer will own it before they buy new technology. So if you're expecting a device to last longer than that, then you have to start looking at different form factors maybe, or a device that is built to last that long. Then you start saying, you know, from a mobile uh, perspective, what screen size should I look at? Because they range anywhere from 7-inch, which is almost a phablet, to a 11.6-inch uh, device that's a 2-in-1 with an attachable keyboard. There is, you know, in a, in a wide range, so you've got 7-inch, 8-inch, 9.5-inch, 10-inch, 10.1-inch, 11.6-inch. Uh, those are the fairly standard screen sizes. But you also have to consider screen quality, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so what kind of connectivity do you, do you need or do you have? So you have to kind of marry the ability of the device to utilize the infrastructure you may have invested in. Um, storage space, what, how much storage, what do you expect to keep on it? What, how are you going to utilize it? Those things will determine what configuration of a tablet you, you might want to consider. Um, and then what apps you're going to run on it in what ecosystem? and what accessories and how much do those cost. So I'm going to get into just kind of the highlights of those things. I get asked this question more than any other question, and that is, which ecosystem is best? You know, should I buy a Windows device, an iPad, an Android, or a Chromebook? And the answer is, it depends. Um, the one thing I prefer to do is I like to have one in ecosystem for all my devices. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It just makes 
the transition between devices easier. So I, I tried to put this together without getting into great detail, but uh, from a Windows device, some of the strengths are it's familiar, it's compatible with other devices you're probably working. There's tons of apps. Office 365 I talked about, cloud services available from Microsoft. There's actually quite a bit of them. You get free storage, free mail, you can get free Outlook online. So they kind of provide all the same functionality as Google does. So uh, although Google has Google Docs that you can use online, um, Microsoft has Microsoft Office Online that's free for anybody that buys a Windows 8.1 device. And you just log in and you, you set up an Outlook account, you have mail, you have storage, and you have all of their devices. Likewise, uh, iPads have uh, some strengths. Obviously, they're familiar to everybody. They've been around the longest in this form factor. Um, they are intuitive to use. You put them in a student's or a child's hand, they get to pick it up and working right away. More importantly, there's enough exposure to them through the interface with the iPhone that the iPad gets, you know, you can learn it pretty quickly when you pick it up. Um, it is a consumer device. It's been brought out as a consumer device, and the consumers have driven it into the business world. Um, if you talk to the IT professionals, they're not crazy about it because it's a hard device to, to manage, and, and there's some security issues around it. But um, most people would prefer that have used it would prefer to stay with it. Uh, it has, as I said, cloud services much like Microsoft. Uh, you can use cross devices, so I, you can use an iPhone and a Windows device, a, a Windows tablet, and likewise an iPad, an iPhone, and a in a Windows uh, environment, and the, everything that's on the cloud is accessible from either device. Uh, Android is the next uh, platform, and Android is typically less expensive than the other devices. I would say that its strength is that you kind of get what you pay for. There is, you know, you could buy Android devices for $70, and you can buy them for $700. Um, the, uh, you know, the challenge is the quality of the product, the uh, it's a very popular interface in phones. It is now, if you look at all of mobile devices, and you, it is now the largest OS of all, them all. So you, there's more Android devices sold than uh, Windows and iPads combined. Now that's primarily in the phone market. So they are, but they have done very well in the consumer um, tablet market as well. And then Chrome is fairly new, and Chrome is really just a uh, it's, it's a very thin OS that allows you to operate a Internet appliance. So you basically have a Internet terminal that you can carry around. And as long as you have Wi-Fi, it gets uh, it gets done. Fair, you can use it fairly easily. Um, and then uh, Windows again. Windows has uh, come out with 8.1, soon to release 10. Uh, I've seen 10. I've played with it. It's actually a really cool product. It, uh, the way they present it. The biggest challenge with the Windows device, I think, is just the learning curve. It is um, quite different than other Windows interfaces, and it takes a little while to learn, but it is an extremely powerful tool, and it is a, um, a wonderful uh, tool to use and a, and a great platform to use. Uh, we talked a little bit about Apple already. I'm just kind of hurrying up because I've got about three minutes left, so I'm going to pace through some of these things relatively quick. Um, Window or a Apple has uh, you know tons of applications. You, you can't really go wrong with an uh, iOS machine. Uh, Android devices. The only downside to an Android device that I see is that Google has no uh, commitment to backwards compatibility. So if you bought a KitKat version of uh, Android device and they come out with Lollipop, which is their next version of Android, there's not any guarantee whatsoever that it'll be compatible. And that to me is a bit of a concern because that's not the same as uh, the other guys. So what other features do you need to think about uh, from a screen perspective size, the type of touch it is, the resolution, and uh, protective glass. If it doesn't have protective glass, then you, need to, you can add it, but you need to buy a cover. Otherwise, you'll scratch it and make a mess of it. Uh, Wi-Fi, uh, single most important. <laughs> thing if you're using it all the time online is how quick is the Wi-Fi in the device compared to what I'm connecting with. So if I have AC connection, which is a gigabyte to the desk, um, I better have an AC tablet or I'm going to be waiting a while. Uh, again, this is, uh, this is all 
relatively new that the Wi-Fi features in the in the tablets has really improved over the last 18 months, and I could and what I see on the horizon is almost every device will come with gigabyte Wi-Fi. Uh, ports, I always look for a full-size USB, some kind of memory slot, HDMI device so I can connect it to a TV or something easily. Um, and then you start looking at what accessories are you going to want. So the price of the device is one thing, but if I need a keyboard and a stylus and a case, uh, I should be looking at that as a package as opposed to the device. I promise I'm going to get here shortly. And then what other things to consider? Uh, warranty coverage, uh, price obviously. Uh, serviceability, so not only warranty, but where is it serviced? Do I have to ship it back? Can I be without it? All of those things. And then uh, how long do you expect to own it? All of those things will help you make a decision on which device is right for you. And I'm done. Terrific, Glenn. We have a lot of questions that have been coming into the chat, and we will get to those in just a few minutes. So if he's not back on the line, I will go ahead and cover these, even though it's sad not to hear Jim's voice since he is uh, really a, an industry leader in refurbished technology, and not just refurbished technology, but in green, all things green technologies. And you know, if you're not familiar with some of his work, you might have heard of Microsoft's Authorized Refurbisher Program, which uh, is, has been worldwide in nearly every country where um, you know, Microsoft partnered to give refurbishers licenses worldwide and really made refurbishing computers uh, an industry of its own where it had previously not existed for the green benefits of extending the end of life of PCs that were cycling out every two to three years in larger corporate institutions. And Jim was really the person who came up with that idea and founded that with Microsoft in partnership. So he's really um, kind of legendary for his work. So I was hoping to hear his voice on the line, but it sounds like he's not there yet. Quickly cover these couple of slides, and then we'll move into um, a little bit about the discounts and donations that are available through TechSoup's site. Then we'll get to your Q&A. So TechSoup obviously has a long tradition of green IT, and we do that in a whole host of, of ways uh, by introducing technologies and inviting partners to help nonprofits, libraries, and churches use less paper, use less energy with your IT, cut down on travel, and promote telework, which I know that's part of that work from anywhere, anytime functionality and benefit of having mobile tech in your office. Um, and we also help to reduce electronic waste with refurbished hardware programs like the partnership that we have with CDI and some other refurbishing partners. And we also help ensure that there's appropriate end of life for your IT equipment. So if you request a tablet or a desktop PC or a laptop through any of our programs through TechSoup, there are electronic take-back programs that help ensure that those products, once you're done with them, are properly recycled and the parts that can be used can be put forward into other products and reused and recreated, and the parts that can't be are properly disposed of so that they're safely put out into the environment, or more safely. Uh, so we have a green technology product donation page that shows all of the different green IT donations we have in our program, and a lot of content that we share on our Green Tech Twitter feed. And just to give you some idea of the comparison of, of why tablets are considered greener is that you know, looking at these first three bullets where desktop computers use 150 watts of electricity during normal use, laptop is 30 to 40 watts, a tablet is only using 10 watts and costs only a couple of dollars of electricity per year to run them. So a huge difference in your energy costs and your usage. Tablets also take less and fewer materials to create than larger desktop PCs. And because tablets contain these circuit boards, they should be properly recycled at end of life so that we can get those copper, gold, rare earth pieces out of them to be reused and keep the toxics out of our natural environment. So keep that in mind if you've got tablets and you're cycling through them with uh, that statistic that Glenn shared earlier, every 24 months that they're going in and out of service. It's kind of shocking and appalling how quickly we're rotating through this and creating so much e-junk that you're aware of how to properly recycle and get those back in, into uh, appropriate channels so that they can use what they uh, can extract from those can be reused, and what they can't is disposed of properly. You never want to throw those in your trash bin. 
There's also this little greener IT challenge and an energy savings calculator. So if you're looking to lower your own energy costs of your organization, then you can go ahead and um, do that little challenge to see how much money you can save on your technology with your green changes that you may make between getting laptops or desktops or tablets. It will calculate out the details for you. So moving us forward, tablets through TechSoup. I just wanted to highlight we do have a CDI discount program with TechSoup, and CDI has both new and refurbished computers. I mentioned in the description of today's event that one of our attendees today will uh, win an Apple iPad 2 tablet, which you see highlighted here on the screen uh, as one of the options. There are a few others that are on their program as well, but I just wanted to highlight a few of these. These are all higher-end business-grade tablets, the EduGear, there's actually two EduGear ones, one that I don't have screenshotted on the page. But those are really I think best tailored for educators or people who are doing more classroom-like education because they come pre-installed with a bunch of resources that are really intended for an educational community. Um, and then the others are a variety of these real pro tablets. And they vary in price. I think the, the lower price end of the spectrum for these was I think around $178 through our program. So certainly more than the off-brand uh, Chinese one that you might buy <laughs> through a co-op or something like that where it may only cost you $100. But they are also much more powerful, and they come with a lot of software and benefits uh, installed on them already. And then I also wanted to mention the Refurbished Computer Initiative, which I highlighted briefly when I was talking about Jim's work, that he started this program, and it is to help keep and extend the life of computers, particularly those higher grade, higher end business computers that giant companies like General Motors or Dell, you know, they might have 30,000 employees and they might be cycling out a third of those computers every two years. And those computers can then get directed into channels to extend their lives another three to five years often. And we do that. You can go to our Refurbished Computer Initiative catalog. And actually I'm just going to highlight here really quickly. See at the very bottom of my screen this blue Browse RCI products button. I don't know if you can see that there. Uh, if you click on that, the next screen it takes you to is this drop-down tab uh, screen where you can look at RCI tablets. You can look at desktop PCs. You can look at laptops. And then you can also select this under Tablets, it offers refurbished tablets or new tablets. If you are looking at PCs or laptops, you can select high tier, mid tier, or lower tier. And they have different benefits. Some of them have different things installed. And they all have warranties, which is great. So the CDI tablets I believe come with a one-year warranty, which is a terrific out-of-the-box warranty that they offer. And then I think uh, you can even extend that directly through CDI for up to three years. So you can keep it lasting and keep it serviced and in service for a long time with your organization. So before we turn over to Q&A, I wanted to highlight a few additional resources on TechSoup's site that extend a little bit of what we've been talking about today. So for those of you looking for a real guide to buying tablets, we have those resources on our site, Laptop versus Tablet, What to Consider, How to Choose a Mobile Device. And these go over all of the details from how much RAM, how much memory, if you are doing cloud, primarily cloud applications and you have got your data stored elsewhere, you may not need 64 gigabytes of memory. <laughs> you may be able to do it with a much smaller memory as long as you have got a good connection to the Internet or maybe built in um, you know, 4G or something like that. So these different guides can help offer some places to start if you are looking for comparisons. We also have uh, lots of content on apps and how to jumpstart your productivity with 75 mobile apps. Uh, lots of This is a webinar from last year on mobile tech for offices and people. It has a lot of information in it about bringing your own device. So for those of you who have staff or volunteers who bring their personal devices to the office, things to consider and how to help set that up so that your network is secure, your data is managed well, you are not violating any HIPAA compliance or PCI compliance laws that you may be um, required to follow at your organization. So lots of different resources, mobiles for non nonprofits and libraries, uh, definitions and terms, how to get started, telecommuting, all kinds of resources. I also highlighted 
a list of resources specific to libraries. Since I know so many of you are joining us from libraries, we have a lot of content that we've covered on this as well. If you're helping patrons with e-readers, we recently ran a webinar on that topic. A great event you should check out that gives some tips on how to do that well and to support your patrons. Lots of different resources here on using apps for story time, ebooks, accepting mobile payments at your library, things like inventory. So these are all included in the slide deck that you'll get from me later this afternoon. You'll get a follow-up email that includes the full recording. Uh, they are all available on our website too, though you'd have to do a little searching to get this full list. So look for the email and pop open those slides. I'll be sure to call a few of them out during, um, in the follow-up email in the body of that email as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open us up to questions. And let me pop this window open. And let's see, Allison asks about HIPAA compliance, which I mentioned and concerns about using the cloud with tablets. Glenn, do you have any advice or tips for organizations that want to be kind of embracing some of these new technologies which often require a little bit more of our use of the cloud instead of locally installed software? How they can manage um, you know, regulations like HIPAA compliance or PCI compliance that limits where they can hold their data. Do you have any there, suggestions on that? Uh, most of the um, uh, again, most of the providers of those services will publish whether they're compliant or not. So, um, and I, I know because I built some data centers that what the requirements are for their end of it. And I, I'm positive Microsoft, Google, and all of those folks fall within have the physical capability of doing that. Uh, quite frankly, we don't. We we have. I haven't had a conversation with them whether they check that box in terms of utilizing their services. But I do know that uh, cloud, most of the cloud services and applications, if you, if you ask them, you'll make a determination whether they're compliant or not. Yeah, and I would agree that it's always something you want to go to that individual cloud vendor or whoever the host of that service is and ask them. I can say for Microsoft's Office 365, having done a number of events with them on that specific topic, that they they say that they are fully HIPAA compliant and that they are maintaining a huge battery of security checks and double checks and backups and things like that to ensure that your data doesn't get into the wrong hands. We can say that, but we also know that in reality, people hack the iCloud and get celebrity photos and share them online. So things can happen. So for sure if you are in an industry or sector where you have sensitive health data of your clients or users or constituents, and that's not supposed to be available anywhere, and you need to track data lineage and things like that, then I would definitely recommend having that conversation with the vendor, doing some research online before you migrate your stuff to the cloud, or at least uh, migrating it, it, that stuff to the cloud. The value of having the stuff in the cloud is always so convenient. It's incredible. And there are all kinds of services that allow you to do those things. Absolutely. You know, because we mentioned Office 365, I've got a handful of questions on the back end that I'm going to quickly just try and answer that are not specifically related to tablets, but really for people wanting to use tablets and needing more info on the cloud. Uh, it's relevant in that regard. Uh, Amy asks, if we are already using Office 365, is there a way to still take advantage of the free for nonprofits offer? And I believe the answer is yes. That I'll, I'll include a link to Offices or Microsoft's Office 365 for Nonprofits page. And it's essentially signing up for a free trial, and then you're verified as being an eligible nonprofit, and then your account goes uh, fully free, and it is no longer a trial. Now, I don't know how data migration is because it may actually create a whole new account. So that's something you'd want to check into. I know that you can access the offer, but you may have to um, – do some migration or talk to them about how to access your data that already exists in Office 365 as you currently have it. So Carl asks, how are companies separating the tablet's work and personal personality in the work and home? So if a lot of companies, he gives the example, offer uh, people to bring their own device, you know, if they're bringing their own and they've got their own Facebook and Twitter installed and they're you know, running apps kind of all the time in the background for their personal things, how do you also separate the work stuff and ensure that the two don't get mixed? Do you have any recommendations on how to do that well, Glenn? 
<laughs> it's, uh, it's a challenge for sure. So if it's a bring your own device uh, environment where you're allowing them access to utilize it and, you're, and you're, it's really tough to tell them how to run it. I mean, um, it, you know, some of it is just behavior policy in the organization. You know, you don't get to spend time on Facebook or uh, Twitter or anything else during work time uh, uh, because even if they even if they don't have it on their uh, tablets or they're using their tablets for work, they have it on their phones and it's at their desk. And I mean, it's almost impossible to get people not to do that stuff. Uh, but providing them, you, you know, I've heard the argument from both sides where kids in classes, for example, were for years were prohibited to use their phones. And what the schools did was they start to they started to incorporate using the phones in the day-to-day -day teaching, and the kids started using them much more effectively for schoolwork. So it, it's kind of that argument that if I, if I make it taboo, it's pretty hard to enforce, but if I somehow allow them to incorporate that device in a more productive way, then, then you actually win out of it as an organization. I'm not sure I answered the question because I'm not sure there is one. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I can say from prior events that we've done, and I'm going to point to this resource again on the additional resource slides, the Mobile Impact 401 webinar that we did. We had a bunch of examples of bring your own device policies and templates that are out there already existing in the world that um, we thought were good examples to share because if you're going to have folks bringing their own devices, whether you like it or not, it would be a great idea to have a policy around what data they can take from your network and have traveling around with them on that device, um, you know, to really try and make it clear what the expectations are of those staff people or board members or volunteers just to ensure that your data and your information is protected and also to ensure that it doesn't get lost if, it, you know, if their tablet busts and that was the only copy of a really important board report or something like that that you've got a process in place and expectations around how to back those up, how to keep them secure, and how to ensure that you know, if they're doing things that are unsavory on their personal devices after hours, that that doesn't get mixed in with your organization's professional reputation by accidentally sharing that online in some way. So I think it's a really good idea to try and have some type of bring your own device plan or policy, even if it's not a huge, big, long thing that just helps set those expectations with people when they come in. Let's see, what else do we have? We have just a couple more minutes here for questions. Um, let's see, we have some folks were asking about the percentage of nonprofits using the cloud, and I can say I don't have that number from the participants since it was just chatted in. I don't know exactly how many uh, of the folks said that they were using the cloud are a percent of, of the total. We did do a big cloud survey of nonprofits, but it's probably two years, maybe three years even old. But I'm happy to share a link to the survey results. And this was global nonprofit usage of the cloud and adoption, kind of the barriers to adopting. But like I said, it's a couple years old, and we know that this cloud migration of nonprofits and everybody else has really expanded rapidly. So. Um, you know, keep that in mind when you read it that it, it's somewhat dated already. You know, we had a kind of specific question, but since we had so many libraries on, I want to ask if you have any ideas, Glenn. Um, we had people asking, is there any software that helps lock down a tablet like Deep Freeze or Clean Slate, which is a common program used in libraries between patrons. So they would use them on their public computing computers uh, or machines where one person logs off and it cleans it and freezes it so that they can't install anything unsavory or that shouldn't be installed, and so that the next patron kind of starts fresh. And I don't know if you have any ideas of things like that. I have a couple of thoughts of my own that I can share, but I want to leave it to you first if you have any thoughts. I think the easiest answer is if there are Windows devices, then Deep Freeze works. So any of the devices where uh, Deep Freeze Deep Freeze works uh, on a laptop or desktop, it will also work on the tablet. Yeah, so and I found that to be you know, true. Yeah, I was going to say I found that to be true too. Pharonix, um, Deep Freeze does work on Windows 8 tablets and 8.1 tablets. Um, and I've, I've also seen other folks using VMware, which has a similar program. And I know that there are some Android-specific programs that are similar, though not necessarily the same. So I would look at whatever 
um, operating system, whatever platform you are using, and do a little searching online because there are some equivalents to uh, Deep Freeze. It may not be something that you can deliver across a network like you would uh, a network and a bunch of thin clients in a PC lab in your library for example, but those apps are available. Great. So we are at just about time here. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this one screen again to chat in one thing that you learned in today's webinar that you will either try to implement or move forward and help you in your own decision making. Uh, I'd also like to invite you to join us for upcoming webinars and events. Um, next week we have two webinars, one specifically for libraries and how they are community connectors who are often referring social services for their patrons and connecting them to the services that they need. And then next Thursday we'll be talking about how to find free and legal to use images and media online. We'll be joined with Creative Commons and Free Music Archive to talk about that. And Jim Lynch, our presenter for today who is blocked, will also be presenting on that one. So if you'd like to hear his voice, please join us for that. Uh, then we'll be talking about launching your 2015 grants plan for those of you who are writing grants or hoping to soon. And we'll be talking about copywriting for the web, how to improve your website copy, and communicate better with today's web-enabled audiences. Thank you so much, Glenn. Really appreciate you taking the time. And thank you, Allie, for helping on the back end. I'm sorry you guys didn't get to hear Jim today. He's been on the back end watching the questions come in, but has just not been able to get his audio to work again. So I apologize for any inconvenience for missing out on his contributions today. Please join us at TechSoupGlobal.org TechSoup.org, and on our Facebook and Twitter for more like this. And join us for those upcoming events. Lastly, thank you to ReadyTalk, our webinar sponsor, who provides the use of this platform. We are using the ReadyTalk 500 tool today, which is also available in TechSoup's catalog. So check that out if you are looking for a webinar tool. And please take a moment to complete the post-event survey. It will pop up once your window closes. Five is excellent, one is poor. So tell us how we are doing so we can continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you all so much, and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.